Okay. Uh, let's continue. Um, so we're going to do a new thing today, exponential growth and decay. Those of you who have to do differential equations at some point, uh, you will be revisiting this and doing it in more generality. But um, at this point, there are just uh, a few things that I guess uh, you'd be expected to know if you took Calc 2. So we are going to go through them. This is what it means to grow exponentially. Um, there are lots of different types of growth. Uh, the two, probably the most basic ones, are what we call linear growth. This means if you are to plot the function, uh, plot uh, how much of something there is after some unit time or with respect to some other variable, it would look like a straight line. Um, then there is another kind of thing that grows exponentially. It's called exponential growth because if you were to plot the graph of p, it will look like an exponential function. Right? Uh, one way you can describe this is to say something grows proportional to its current size, meaning the higher the quantity, the, more, the larger the rate of growth. Uh, so as the quantity increases, so does the slope of the function. Uh, exponential functions behave this way, and they behave in that way in this precise manner. Um, another way to describe exponential growth is something that grows by a constant percentage over time. So instead of growing by two units per second, something that grows by two percentage points per second, for example, would be something that grows exponentially as opposed to linearly. Um, this means, let's, let's talk about growth just to be a little bit specific. Um, if p grows exponentially, what we mean is that its rate of growth, p prime, let's say it's a function of time, it is going to be uh, proportional to its current size, meaning it's going to be a constant. We usually call this constant r times the current size of p. Okay? A lot of things have exhibit this kind of behavior. Population is a, is a very common one that grows exponentially. The more people there are, the, the faster a population will grow because you have more people having more babies. Um, so a smaller population will grow slower than a larger population because you just have more people reproducing. So linear, a, a population won't grow linearly, it will grow exponentially, for example. Another situation is for decay. A common example there is a radioactive substance. Um, radioactive things will decay exponentially, meaning the larger the mass of the quantity that you have, the more of it will radioactively decay over time. And so that's, these are just some common applications. You'll see this all over the place. So if you're in chemistry, you're in any type of engineering, you're in physics, you are going to care about exponential growth at some point. Um, this kind of equation here, P of t equals the amount of quantity at time t. Uh, P prime is the rate of 
growth of P. R is called the growth constant. Or sometimes R is called the relative growth rate. Don't mix this up with rate of growth. They're two different things. Relative growth rate or growth constant is R, or this can be just the percentage change per time. Um, as a decimal, usually it's written in a decimal form, not percentage form. Uh, that's that. Um, this kind of equation is called a differential equation. equation uh, for the simple fact that there is a derivative in the equation. It's a, an equation that contains the derivative of some dependent variable. Um, yeah, so that's called a differential equation. There is a, an entire class called differential equations, and then there's a class after that called partial differential equations that you could take here and many other places that studies nothing but equations that look like that. Um, but we are going to study this particular one it's called a differential equation. Um, sometimes we know the value of P at a particular time. say something like p at time 0 is 500, meaning when time equals 0, we have 500 things. This equation is called an initial condition. P prime equals RP, and then I can put a comma, and I can say something like P0 equals P0 is a very common notation. So this is the differential equation, and the value of it at some beginning time, which we usually call T0. This is called uh, the differential equation. This is called the initial condition. and everything together is called an initial value problem. Or IVP. Now, we can solve this particular differential equation. does it mean to solve a differential equation? So you're given some equation that has derivatives in it, right? It's called a differential equation. 
solving the differential equation means you want to find an equation that relates all the variables present here but has no derivatives in it. So uh, preferably you'd like to solve for the, in the dependent variable explicitly. So hopefully we'd like to say p equals something and there are no derivatives anywhere. Or sometimes it, it has to be implicit depending on how complex the problem is. Uh, this one it turns out we can actually solve for it explicitly. And so solving the differential equations is simply just finding a relationship between the p and the t and the r such that there are no deriv derivatives present. Uh, separation of variables is a particular technique to get this done. It doesn't always work, but in nice cases it does work. In particular, in this case it would work. As the name suggests, uh, we separate the variables in order to be able to solve it. So, let me show you that. So if you have p prime equals r of p, um, we can take advantage of the Leibniz notation. Now back in Calc 1, I always used to tell my students that the Leibniz notation is very versatile, um, but I don't think we ever really showed how versatile it is. Here's one example in which it's versatile. You can actually use it uh, almost as if it's a computational quality, uh, quantity. Like for example, dp dt, when I think of the derivative, I can actually think of this as a fraction in its own right in a lot of cases. And what I could, for example, do is uh, separate the dp from the dt. For example, I can multiply by the dt. And then I can divide both sides by p. Now, remember your r is a constant, so that's not a variable here. And what you would now notice is that I have separated the variables. I have all the p's on one side and all the t's on the other side. And in this form, it's very convenient because what I could do at this point is put an integral sign in front of them. And it turns out this process actually works out to be a mathematically valid process. I can literally split the Leibniz notation and create two integral, an integral equation. Now, I can now integrate both sides. What's the integral of dp over p? Ln of p. Ln of absolute value of p. And the integral of r dt? Rt. Rt plus a constant. Now, yes, you get a constant over here, but by convention, we always just bring all the constants to one side, uh, the right side conventionally, and uh, just put a plus C on one side. Next, what we can do to solve for the P, just can E both sides, uh, then we would be able to say that our P is equal to C E to the R T. Now, why can I say that? Notice here what we have is e to the rt times e to the c by laws of exponents. But the c, e to the c is just another constant. So I pretty much just call it a big C. Again, I just put it in front. Um, now, if I apply the initial condition, Since p of 0 equals p naught, what happens is if I plug in t equals 0, I can plug in p equals p naught. This means p naught would be equal to c e to the r times 0. In other words, that's just c. So this ultimately means I can go back and say that my p, or p of t specifically, is going to be p naught e raised to the r t. And here is an equation that relates the variables p and t, and there are no derivatives present. Um, this guy is affectionately called the PERT formula, p e to the rt, um, you know, like the shampoo in condition one. Okay, so this is the PERT formula. We can get it from solving an equation that looks like this. Uh, it's a differential equation mm -hmm. that describes exponential growth. Uh, solving that equation means we can get this. This is called the solution to the differential equation. And we'll 
looking at by a separation of variables. Now, there are some other things that often come up here. We often want to know things like How long would it take P to double? Or triple, or quadruple, or something else. Um, so what we can do is we can actually go to this equation, the solution to the differential equation. Anytime I want to answer a question about P, I can go here. And so This means we want t so that our p is equal to double of what we started with. And so we can actually solve this. So this means I would have 2p naught equals p naught e to the r t. How do I solve for t? <coughs> How do I solve this for t? Both sides. I mean, if I divide by p naught. Right, we can divide both sides by p naught, assuming it's not zero. If it was zero, the thing isn't growing. There's nothing there to grow. Um, so we can assume p naught is not zero, and divide both sides by p naught at two e to the r equals e to the r t. Then. Ln both sides. We can log both sides. Ln two equals ln of e to the r t. Then. And uh, ln e crosses out. So this means your t is equal to ln2 over r. In other words, the time to double is equal to ln of 2 over r, which is the percentage growth rate of the exponentially growing quantity. And you could also imagine here, if I wanted the time to triple, um, the process would be pretty much the same. I would just put a 3 instead of a 2. I would get ln3 over r, time to quadruple, ln4 over r, the time to increase by a factor of 10, ln10 10 over r, etc. If I want to increase by a factor of k, uh, the time that it will take to do that is going to be ln of k over r. This is uh, a property of exponential functions. It grows very nicely. And at this point, I think we actually spoke about everything. Yeah. So, if you look at this sheet I gave you, which again, it's on the... Uh, it's on the class webpage. We just uh, spoke about all the equations in this box right here. So that's where these equations are coming from. So there's the differential equation. That one pretty much comes from definition. We just define things that obey that differential equation to be exponentially growing quantities. Um, why do we call it exponentially growing quantities? Because if we solve that differential equation, we get an exponential function. Um, that starts at p naught when t is 0. Uh, this is called the initial condition. It's just that if we know the value of p at some point in time, we can state it as an equation. This is the solution to the differential equation, and t sub d equals ln2 of r is the time to double. Um, so that's how we got all of those guys here. Now, with decay, things are actually quite similar. <coughs> difference is, uh, this one is decreasing over time instead of increasing over time. Uh, so it starts out looking like minus rp, 
right? So the rate of growth of P is actually negative if we assume R to be positive. Um, so we can actually go through and solve this in the same way. We get P equals P naught E to the minus RT. Uh, you'll actually get, uh, so this guy will look like that where it's passing through P naught. And this guy will look like that where it's passing through P naught at zero. And here, a very common thing that we want to find out, especially if we're in science, uh, we often want to know things like, what is the half-life? Half-life is simply the time taken for to the quantity to have half of what it started with. started with that's the current value I want to know how, what time do I have half the, the current value uh, again I can divide both sides by P naught I would get one half equals e to the minus RT I can ln both sides it's going to be minus RT and so I can get T is equal to minus ln of one half over R um, which if you look at the formula sheet here, it says the half-life is ln2 over r, which means this is equal to ln2 over r. How can we show that it's equal to ln2 over r? <clears throat> yeah? Um, could you rewrite ln1 over 2 as ln of 1 minus ln2? Mm -hmm. So we can do that. ln of 1 is actually 0. So we have minus a minus ln2, we get ln of 2 over r. <coughs> So the half-life T sub H is ln of 2 over R. And similarly, how long will it take to have a third of the original value? ln 3 over R. How long will it take to have a fifth of the original value? ln 5 over R, etc. Um, but half-life and doubling time are very common things to ask for decay and growth, uh, respectively. We measure a lot of things in terms of half-life. Um, but the equations are actually quite similar. So you can have an initial condition here. That's your differential equation with initial condition. This will be the solution to your differential equation, and this will be your half-life. ask you to derive these, but you probably should learn how to derive them. It's actually good practice. And for those of you who will need it eventually, you might as well. Let's do some examples of applying these guys. So the problems here will typically be word problems. Let's uh, tackle problem one.
Okay. So let P be the current size of the population of a colony of bacteria at time T. At 10 a.m. there are 50 bacteria, at 3 p.m. there are 350. Assume the rate of growth of the population is proportional to its current size. Find the relative growth rate, find the formula for P, find blah, blah, blah. Do five, these five things. Okay, so um, one thing I do want to point out here, I mean, I don't think you'll see similar problems, but uh, might as well just in case, how you actually know you'd have to do, uh, think of something as exponential growth. It says here P grows proportionally to its current size. That is, by definition, exponential growth. So that phrase indicates to you that you're going to want to consult this list of equations. Uh, we could, the problem could straight up say P grows exponentially. That will also mean uh, you want to consult this list of equations. You could say, also say something like P increases by 2% uh, per whatever unit time. This also means exponential growth. Um, normally, if something is mentioned in population, there are going to be other growth models, uh, but uh, they're, ten they're going to tend to be uh, exponential growth. Similarly, if you hear radioactive substance, you're going to think exponential decay. Um, this actual equation here, in the context of biology, we call this the Malthus model of population growth. But there are others. But yeah, so that's the first thing. There's a certain key. F there are certain key phrases that triggers you to think of the exponential growth and decay formulas, and these are some of them. So once that. For that sentence uh, here tells me, assume the growth of the population is current to its proportional. It's proportional to its current size. It means to me that this list of equations is now relevant, so I can use that list of equations to answer anything about here. So uh, let's actually go in and get this done. A, what is the relative growth rate of the population? What are they asking us for here? R, they're asking for a little r. So here we want to find R. Uh, how are we going to find R? Yeah? We have two conditions. And so mm -hmm. you can set 10 a.m. equal to 0. And okay. Set uh, T equals 0 at 10 a.m. So you can say P of 0 is um, 50. Uh, let T equal, say, time in hours because they mentioned 4 p.m. and stuff like that. So let's measure time in hours. That seems to be nice. OK. So we are given that p of 0 is 50. Yeah. What else do we know? At 3 p.m., uh, this means t equals 5. We are given P of 5 equals 350. Now, of course, because we know that this list of formulas are applied, what can I say now? How would I use those to find R? 350 equals 50 e to the 5t, 5r. Right, so I know that this means, uh, we know that P is equal to P naught E to the RT. Of course, if I plug in T equals 0, I would get P naught. Uh, so P0 equals 50 implies that P naught equals 50. And so applying P, applying P of 5, we get the following. P of 5 is equal to 350, so that's going to equal to 50, which is the P naught, 
e to the r, which I don't know, that's in fact what I want to find, times t, which is 5, by assumption here. So this means uh, I can actually solve for the r here. I can divide both sides by 50. That'll give me 7. I can ln both sides. And so my r is actually going to be ln 7 over 5. And that's the relative growth rate. And that, that'll give you some decimal. You can multiply this by 100% and say it's growing by this percent per hour, if you want. But that's fine for me. Actually, just say the rate of growth is that. The growth constant, or the relative growth rate, is ln of 7 over 5. B. E. What is the formula for P of T? What is the size of the population at 4 p.m.? What is this asking for? P of 6. Right. This means P of 6. Uh, how do I find P of 6? Well, I have a formula for P, so I'm just going to plug in 6. Uh, yeah, once you know this list of equations, these problems aren't going to be uh, too bad, especially from what we've been doing this whole semester. So this means I just uh, literally just plug in 6, e to the ln of 7 over 5 times 6. That's the answer. D. What is the rate of growth at 4 p.m.? When will the population reach uh, 1,500? What do we do 
here. <coughs> Set P equals 1500. This means we need 1500 equals 50 E to the ln of 7 over 5 T. And now I just solve for time because they asked us when. So divide both sides by 50. Uh, what is that, 30? ln both sides, ln of 30 is equal to ln of 7 over 5t, and so our t is going to be 5 ln 30 over ln 7. Any questions on these questions? So the problems, like on a test or a quiz, are going to look like this. You're, you're not really going to need to derive the formulas, but you, at the very least, need to know them. So make sure you memorize everything that's in a box here. Uh, also memorize that. Which I'll, I'll, I'll make a little tweak to that, but it won't actually matter too much. Um, so memorize these formulas and just know when it asks for a certain thing, you should know which one of these formulas you want to actually use to get it. It's pretty much uh, what you're going to need to know here. Like I said, you have an entire class on differential equations that a lot of you will have to take, so you'll learn about these guys and many more guys like them later on. But in Calc 2, you at least need to be familiar with the idea uh, and know how to use these equations. Um, now here's something interesting about exponential growth. Now we've mentioned where e came from. Uh, if I haven't mentioned it this semester, I did last semester. Uh, so remember that e uh, was the number that we got when we took the limit as n approaches infinity, one plus one over n to the nth power. Right? Um, and where did that actually come from? Well, Euler was considering the uh, question um, if you start with a dollar and compounded continuously meaning you're applying compound interest an infinite number of times uh, within any given time period, compounding continuously at 100% interest rate. So this is like a really malevolent credit card company. They're, they're really trying to squeeze the most money out of you for uh, one year. Um, it turns out that if you start with a dollar and you apply this kind of interest at this really aggressive rate, uh, at the end of the year you'll have around $2.72 in your account, which is uh, the rounded value for E. So we know E is an irrational number, and this is how it was actually computed. Or there was considering this question, which led to this limit, which led to this number. And that number was very important, turns out to be very important in calculus. We figured it out when we were trying to find the derivative of the exponential and we used to derive the power rule and all sorts of stuff. So that's a very important quantity right there. So now, um, in general, say we have uh, the compound interest formula. So this is the formula that says uh, the amount after some time is going to be whatever your initial amount is <coughs> times uh, 1 plus r over n 
to the n times t. This is the compound interest formula. And so r is going to be your interest rate, n is going to be the number of times that interest is added on top of interest, or as we say, compounded per year. t is the time per, uh, in years. We would have this formula that tells you the current balance of the account after time t. Uh, so say we have the compound interest formula, and we want to uh, apply continuous compounding. What would A equal uh, after some time T? So whatever time period you give me, I want us to apply continuous compounded with in that time period. What that means is uh, you go crazy with the compound interest and compound it an infinite number of times per year. Uh, we get A would be the limit as n approaches infinity of P naught 1 plus R over n to the n times T. Now, what we can do is something like the following. Set x equals n over r. r, is, remember, it's a constant. Uh, this means as n approaches infinity, x will approach infinity. Um, it also means uh, that n would be equals to r times x. It also means that r over n would be equal to 1 over x. Applying these, substituting these, <coughs> into 1, let's call that 1, we get your a would be equal to the limit as x approaches infinity of p times 1 plus 1 over x to the x times r times t, because your n is x r x. And this is, of course, equal to infinity of p naught times 1 plus 1 over x to the x rt. We know that limits pass through continuous functions, so this is actually the limit as x approaches infinity of 1 plus 1 over x to the x to the rt. And you'll notice that that inside is the definition of e. So it turns out we get the PERT formula again. This means the solution to this problem is the same as the solution to P prime equals RP, where P now equals that. And so it turns out this particular kind of crazy financial situation can be described with the, the exponential growth equations. Again, can describe it by, if P is the current balance in an account, uh, we can assume that it's growing proportional to its current size. And if I start with a principle of P naught, then it means that my P is going to be equal to P naught e to the R of T. It also means that my time to double is going to be equal to ln2 over R. 
And in this case, the interpretations are P equals current balance in the account. R is the interest rate on the account. an annual percentage rate, which we call APR. T is the time in years. It doesn't have to be years, but if you change the time units here, you have to change the time units there. Make sure your interest rate and your time are in the same time units. And P naught is the initial principle. And so whenever you see a problem that mentions compounded continuously, How is that going to grow? Well, the answer is going to be it's going to grow like this. Now, there are things you can do to this account to actually tweak things. Like, for example, someone who's making regular deposits of a certain value will actually change this by adding a constant. If you're making regular withdrawals, you'll change this by subtracting the constant. And then you do the whole separation of variables thing again, and you'll get a different kind of scenario. But uh, for the most part, without anyone tampering with it, that's how it's going to grow. And so, when you look at, say, problem four, uh, it asks you about a, a, a bank account being compounded continuously. Once you see that phrase, what it means is the exponential growth formula is actually applied to that account. Um, now, of course, we can't ever actually apply interest an infinite amount of times per year. So, while this is actually directly applicable in a lot of situations, in the financial situations, it's more of a limiting value. So where you, where, if we're, you want to kind of figure out what is the worst case scenario, if like interest rates go out of whack, like completely, right? Um, how do you actually model that? You probably model it using an exponential equation, even though in actual reality, you'll probably never actually hit this level. But it represents some sort of uh, possibility to the future how bad things can get. Now, that being said, um, we have, you have all the information to be able to talk about, to be able to do problems two and four. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to give you guys 10 minutes to do problems two and four, then we'll go through it. Then we'll talk about problem three, which involves Newton's law cooling. Maybe 10 minutes is too long. So actually try those and we'll do it together after the intermission.
The show will start in eight minutes. The show will start in seven minutes. start in six minutes. start in five minutes. start in four minutes.
show will start in three minutes. start in two minutes. show will start in one minute. substance is 30 years so once they say half-life you automatically know you should be looking at the uh, exponential decay box suppose we have a 200 milligram sample of the substance and P of T is the mass remaining after T years we find the differential equation satisfied by P what is that Well, the differential equation is P prime equals minus RP, and you need to actually find the R in this. How do you find the R? Um, you said 30 equals to ln2 over R. Right. We know that half-life is ln2 over R, so this means that 30 years is equal to ln2 over R, which means that your R is equal to ln2 over 30. This means P prime equals minus ln2 over 30 times P is your differential equation. Um, it's not times P naught, it's times P. So it is, a, it's a, it is a variable here. So the derivative function is equal to minus ln over 2 of 30 of the original function, of the uh, function without derivatives. B, find a formula for P of T. What is P of T? Right, you know, you know e to the minus rt, so it's going to be 200 
e to the negative ln2 over 30t. E. So that is the formula that gives you the amount after time t. How much will remain after 75 years? We just plug in t equals 75 yeah. here. So this is just p of 75. This is 200 e to the minus ln2 over 30 times 75. If you want to know what that is roughly as a decimal, be my guess, but I don't particularly care. That's the answer. After how many years will the mass be reduced to 1 milligram? So assuming we started with 200, how long will it take to actually hit uh, 1 milligram? Will it decay to 1 milligram? Uh, what does this mean? So when we write QT is equal to 1E to the negative ln2 over 30T. No. You want P to be equal to 1. So you actually want 1 equals 200. Oh, okay. E to the minus ln2 over 30 to the T. The okay. initial is always going to be 200. Uh, what they're asking here is when is the final amount or the current amount going to be 1. So this means we have 1 over 200 uh, equals E to the minus ln2 over 30 times T. So I can log both sides, ln of 1 over 200 is equal to, equal to minus ln 2 over 30 t. And then I can actually divide. So this is 30 ln of 1 over 200 over ln 2. Now, one thing you should notice, that is a positive number. Um, so you should actually recognize that that makes sense here. Ln of 1 over 200 is actually minus ln of 200. So this is going to be 30 ln of 200 divided by ln of 2. And of course, ln of 200 is positive, so is ln of 2. And that's how many uh, years it's going to take to actually decay to 1. Every 30 years, it'll decay by a half. So after 30 years, you'll have 100 milligrams. Then after another 30 years, you'd have 50. Then another 30 years, 25, and so on and so forth. And at this point in time, it'll have one. What is the rate of growth at the time that one is remaining? So at the moment that there is one remaining, one milligram, how fast is it decaying at that point? What is the rate of growth? Well, this means it's talking about this equation. And we want, we want P prime of 1. This means uh, we want P prime of 1 equals R at P of P. 1 is the amount that's left over. Uh, we want P of T. Uh, and we want p to be 1. So this means that our p prime is going to be r, which was ln2 over 30 times 1. So that was that. Move on to problem four. A mythical bank pays 5% interest rate compounded continuously. Suppose you deposit $4,000 into this, into an account with this bank. A, write down a differential equation with initial condition whose solution gives you the balance. Uh, so in A, we know a couple things. One, the interest rate is 5%. Two, it's compounded continuously. Three, I know that the initial principle, uh, the principle that's deposited is 4,000. Uh, this means that my differential equation with initial condition 
is going to be this comma p of zero equals four thousand. At what rate in dollars per year is your account increasing when the balance reaches six thousand? So when p equals six thousand, uh, the account is growing. P prime equals 0 0.05 times 6,000. How long will it take for the principal to reach 5,000? So if I deposited 4,000, how long before the money in the account will grow under this interest of 5,000? C. Uh, what we do here is we know, or we should know at this point, that our P is equal to P naught E to the RT, where T is the time in years. And so we want the final amount, the current balance to be 5,000. So I'm simply going to solve this equation.